plant babies, plant seeds especially, do not want to get eaten. And they have all sorts of these amylase and trypsin inhibitors. We see this kind of across the, uh, the various plant species with some variation. But, and plant seeds broadly is seeds, grains, nuts, and legumes. And we can talk about the nuts and seeds versus the grains and legumes, which we may differ in opinion on. But what we're talking about here is that plant babies, I think most of us would agree, go on the far end of the spectrum of plant toxicity. These are pretty toxic things. Plants don't want these to get eaten. And they put all sorts of things yeah. in them to kind of really mess with our guts. Would you guys agree with all that? Yeah. yeah I, I'm going to jump in a little bit. Um, sorry, it was long done. No, go ahead, Mark. I, I was going to jump in with one, a case study story that is, is kind of a, a fascinating thing that we did. As I said, when we first started doing this, we were doing it for autoimmune patients. Um, so there's a couple of things. I think that you can look at clinically, some people are going to have issues with a leaky gut. And so that plays into it. You've also got the epidermal growth factor uh, thing there as well, where you may have an intact gut, but basically some of these lectins, these dietary, uh, and uh, you know, I always say to my, my clients and patients, kind of nutrition 101, a protein should get digested in the stomach. These lectins are resistant to the proteolytic enzymes in the gut. And if it's a leaky gut, or if in fact it can bind that receptor and get it into your systemic system, you've got something that shouldn't be there in its intact state and that's where all sorts of problems could arise so and obviously the dairy equation comes into it you know it points out you've got something like uh, a 5,000 fold <laughs> increase in epidermal growth factor which we have in our saliva to help repair the gut in small quantities but then someone consumes milk and it's meant for a calf not for a human and you have a 5,000 fold increase, it upregulates that receptor, and all of a sudden you've got a lot more of these lectins getting into the systemic system. So I think we're gonna have a huge spectrum of genetics there, of some people getting affected more than others. But I wanted to just, and I think this is important perhaps for your listeners, when you talk about autoimmunity, about the need to be strict for certainly a while to determine what foods might be a problem. We had a, as I said, we were working with autoimmune patients, and. I was sort of going off doing lectures almost uh, on Dr. Cordain's behalf. I did want to remember to uh, some hunters who were loving the message that we were sending out. <laughs> uh, I think I was featured in Bowhunter magazine, was it? <laughs> yeah, something like that. And, uh, you went up into uh, the, the mountains of Colorado for that, didn't you? Went to one of the churches, that was interesting. They were a modern church that believes the, the, the earth was, I think, 4,000 years old. So oh. I had to kind of change how I approached selling the concept. But anyway, the point was we were getting um, information back from people, requests to sort of, they wanted to try this. And there was one particularly interesting case study, a lady with multiple sclerosis. So we said, okay, well, we know we're not hurting you. We've done a dietary analysis. We feel we've got a good diet. We think it might help. So she goes on the diet and immediately starts to see improvements. Um, in another meeting with another friend that had fibromyalgia, wanted to do it. In that discussion, she mentioned she liked green beans. And I mistakenly said, oh, that's more uh, alkaline. I think you can probably consume those. It was a bad recommendation, but um, she went home. She loved them, ate them for a couple of days, got on the phone with me and said, I, I clearly can't do green beans. I got on the phone with Dr. Cordain. She said, yeah, same genus. You know, we, we shouldn't be doing that. Whoops, sorry, mistake learned. Further down the road, looking at some of the research with multiple sclerosis, we were trying to get the uh, DHA levels elevated, which had been shown to help in certain circumstances. Docasa, hexanoic acid, so one of the omega-3 fatty yeah, acids. Yep. Central, you know, so fish oil, DHA, and EPA, this is the DHA component. Uh -huh. uh, found a lot in brain tissue, actually. So anyway, I, you know, back then, didn't work with good quality supplements. Just sent her to the local health food store and said, see if you can get some DHA, we think that might help. She goes home, takes two, I think, two capsules of DHA. Calls me up and says, well, clearly I can't do this DHA. I, I had a terrible reaction to it. And I'm like, going, that, that just seems strange. Dr. Cordain and I were talking, we're trying to figure it out. And go, you know what, maybe there's something else in that, that pill. I said, get, get the bottle, read out what's on the, um, on, the bill, on the bottle for me. And she said, okay, it says that the uh, gelatin capsule is darkened with a herbal extract carob 
That's not a herbal extract. That's a bean <laughs> extract. Carrot is a bean extract. We'd already established that legumes and beans are not good for her. So I don't know how much was in that, but it's kind of like a kid with a peanut allergy. I don't think you need a lot to trigger that whole immune system. So when you are trying to deal with an autoimmune case, you do have to be strict for quite some time to try and clean the system out. And then you can reintroduce things to see if they're offending but you have to do it one at a time too. And obviously you can do lab tests and stuff like that. But, but I always, that's always a story of a case study that we, we found rather remarkable.